70% of our planet is covered with water. But what happens under the oceans? Do we know? The honest truth is we have very little idea whatsoever. And what happens at the very bottom of the ocean? If you ask us, we couldn't tell you hardly a thing. And thus is the theme of tonight's story, a fantastic three-part effort from one of my favourite authors, Mr. Richard Saxon. Now, you may have heard the first two parts elsewhere on YouTube, but the third part is being released exclusively by me this evening, and you're getting all three parts in one go. So, my dear friends, if you've got an hour to spare, I do so hope you do, because it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. They told me you were experienced in harsh waters, James said as he pointed out the pearls of sweat that had formed on my forehead. Yeah, I do. I replay moments before hurling the remnants of a less than appetizing lunch off the side of our ship. It's just that, oh, you look a bit green around the gills, he continued with a smirk. We'd just met a few hours ago. I'd been airlifted to USS Orion, a sea lift handling abyssal transport capsules for a classified project conducted by the United States Navy. I guess they failed to mention that I'm much better underwater in submarines, I shot back. Considering the circumstances, his casual demeanour left an uncomfortable atmosphere among the workers. They all knew what my visit entailed, but just like myself, they were scant with information. All I knew was that there might be a contagious infection at the bottom of the ocean, and my job was to either disprove it or to confine the entire crew aboard the station. As soon as we were positioned securely on top of the Tonga Trench, we were rushed into the transport capsule, a minuscule, vertical submarine designed to simply take us to the base on the ocean floor, 20,000 feet below us, Talos. I entered the sub, feeling excited, while also dreading the return to the deep blue. It had been ten years since serving as a hospital corpsman, one of the few actually stationed aboard a submarine. Over the years, I clearly lost the natural sense I once had for the ocean, yet I longed desperately for it. Whenever you're ready, Doc, one of the crew members said, impatiently waiting to drop us into the abyss. I raised my thumb. As ready as I'll ever be, go ahead. Ten feet, the sunlight zone. The impact with the ocean lightly shook the capsule. As we submerged, my nausea quickly diminished, and a sense of peace washed over my mind. I was back. Outside the window, a few curious fish accompanied our journey downwards, various sea life attracted by the cargo ship, following to see us off. James piloted the miniature sub. Having done the trip a thousand times before, it wasn't anything new to him. Myself, I'd never been below two thousand feet, Never had I been able to look through the window and admire the mostly unexplored blue world. 3,300 feet, the midnight zone. As we sank deeper towards the abyss, the last strays of sunshine vanished. We'd left the realm of sunshine and mankind, all in favour for the domain of darkness. First time in the abyss, right? James asked after a long bout of silence. Yeah, served aboard a submarine for a few years, but, well, they never go very deep. This, this is something else. He smiled at me. Well, you're in for a treat, then. We're going all the way down. Talos sits right at the edge of the trench. Ain't nothing quite like it. Any sea life once curious about our sub had long since retreated towards brighter areas. The rapidly increasing pressure had proven hostile to most, but some resilient little creatures had found a way to thrive in places once thought to be lifeless. Ah, the miracles of the ocean. Within half an hour, we'd reached a depth of 10,000 feet. Beyond the 15-inch glass pane, separating us from certain death, lay nothing but everlasting darkness. For all we knew, the two of us could have been all that existed in that void, if not for the sound of the outer hull settling under the pressure, a constant reminder about the vastness of the ocean. 
To distract myself from the unsettling creaking sound, I asked James about the only thing I could think about. Why don't you tell me more about what happened down there? James had acted casual thus far, but my question quickly changed his nonchalant expression to a frown. They briefed you on the surface, didn't they? Of course, but... Well, then that'll have to do, he said firmly. 13,100 feet, the abyssal zone. The world outside hypnotized me, staring so far into nothing. Knowing there could be a full world only a couple of feet before you was bizarre. I'd never experienced true darkness until that day, and to think a good portion of Earth's life had existed within it for millions of years, it terrified me. When I served aboard USS Catasia, my captain had explained why they don't put windows on submarines. He told stories about shipmates going crazy after years at sea, that the isolation or distance from the mainland never bothered any of them. He firmly believed that staring into the ocean and pondering its secrets was what truly drove men from their sanity, and to combat this, they never put windows on their vessels. It was clearly a tale he'd made up. Seeing what truly lies beyond the surface brought back these memories. Maybe he was right, after all. My sinister thoughts were interrupted by a dim light appearing in the distance, a red dot dancing blissfully up and down, getting closer to our little sun. It was a jellyfish. Oh, would you look at that, James said as he pointed at the little creature, so fragile yet defying the deep sea pressure. Another light joined in, then a few more, and before long a symphony of pulsating crimson lights formed around our capsule, welcoming us with the warmth of thousands of stars, making up their own little galaxy thousands of feet below the surface. It was the most magnificent thing I'd ever seen, a bloom of jellyfish happily existing in such hostile conditions. I couldn't help but feel impressed. They are called Atolla jellyfish, James stated. They don't usually venture this far down, but there's something about this place that seems to attract them. I usually see a few on my journeys down here, but never anything like this. I nodded in response, too mesmerized by the sight to notice what he'd said, but as quickly as they appeared, they vanished, once more leaving us in absolute darkness. Listen, Doc, I'm sorry about that outburst earlier. James said. I turned towards him, turning my back to the darkness for the first time. It made me feel vulnerable. Uh, you gotta understand, this ain't something we usually deal with, and Mike, well, I've known him most of my life. I know how much this sucks, believe me. I'm just trying to get as much info as possible, for all our sakes, I said. Yeah, well, there's nothing I could tell you anyway. The airlock has been on lockdown for the past two days. We've been under strict orders not to open it until you deem it safe enough to do so. I didn't ask any further questions. I'd dealt with contagions ever since leaving the Navy, and 90% of the time, they were simple overreactions. 19,700 feet. The Ocean Basin. For the first time since we left the ship, the radio came to life emitting a static sound, one that slowly took the shape of a man's voice. James, can you hear me? the voice asked. Loud and clear, Captain. I've got our man from the CDC with me as well. We're just about ready to dock. Great. The crew is getting impatient. We... <laughs> the radio started breaking up. Oh, damn. The radio is... <laughs> dark at Section A. Don't... It shut off completely. Welcome to the Abyssal Zone, James said. The radio has been acting strange lately. Imagine giving us a state-of-the-art station, but comms from the last millennium. Through the window we could see a massive dome lit up by hundreds of lights. Three paths stretched from its center, each lit up by different colors, making sectors A, B, and C. There was something else lit up by the station's light. At first, 
just obscured figures leaving shadows in the sand. And as we got closer, I realized they were fish. Hundreds, if not thousands, of dead sea creatures littering the ocean bed, their corpses mangled from the intense pressure. Christ, what the hell is up with the fish? I asked, horrified. Same as the Atala. Something attracts them down here. They swim until their bodies break under the pressure, and then they sink. What could possibly do that? Well, there are a few theories, but from what we can tell, it's a sound that we periodically hear from the trench. The docking process in itself took quite some time. The outer hull had changed ever so slightly due to the high pressure, just enough so that fitting into the station proved a challenge. As the doors finally opened, I stumbled outside the capsule, greeted by three of the crew members aboard. You're the doctor, right? The oldest of them asked. That's correct, I said as he reached out his hand to introduce himself. My name's Robert Lewis. I'm the captain assigned to Talos, he said as he shook my hand. Thank you for coming this far. I know it's not the most pleasant journey. He seemed polite enough, though clearly sleep-deprived, with bloodshot eyes and greasy hair. This is Jennifer Burke. One of our biologists, and that's Henry Gale, our technician, he said. They both shook my hand, neither making eye contact as they did. Hey, Cap, where's Abby? James asked. Still at Section B. She's not doing too well, as I'm sure you can understand, he responded. James nodded. Let's talk, Robert said as he gestured for me to follow. The hallways were narrow dimly lit up with lights that flickered and constant creaking emitting from the walls. It looked disproportionate considering how large it had all seemed from the outside, and as a rather tall guy, I had to crouch down to keep my head from knocking into the ceiling. I'm sorry about the grim mood, Robert said. It's the first time we're dealing with something like this. I'm assuming they told you about the situation on the surface, he asked. They did, but I have to admit... I'm a bit fuzzy on the details. As are we. Mike put himself in lockdown as soon as he returned to the station, and we haven't had clearance to open it yet. He... Mike... didn't give any good reasons? I asked. He never got the chance. He fell over dead the second he hit the button. Robert led us into the central dome. In contrast to the hallways, it was a pleasant surprise. A large living space filled with furniture and personal affects. Had I not known better, I could have believed we were still on the surface. Mike discovered some microorganisms down in the trench. A new type of parasite, he said. He claimed they were able to withstand any amount of pressure, which isn't a surprise down here, but, well, he also explained that they were completely unaffected by rapid changes in environment, Robert said as he headed inside an office. Did he believe it was contagious? I asked. Seeing as he was our microbiologist, I, I can't really come up with another fathomable conclusion. Needless to say, we destroyed all the samples. But we still don't know why he put himself into lockdown. Robert sighed. But that's not the strangest thing. I waited patiently for him to continue. While he tried to form words, he clearly had trouble believing himself. We, um, lost him down in the trench for three entire days. The tracking system failed and the comms went down. We did whatever we could, but it was futile. Even if we had found him, he only had enough oxygen for ten hours. So we, unfortunately, well, we presumed he'd died. And then, out of nowhere, his tracker reappeared on our systems, showing he was moving back up the Tonga elevator. And though he never responded to any of our attempts at contacting him, he was clearly alive. How? It's impossible. Yet it happened. Once we led him into the station, he simply locked it down and fell over dead on the ground. Before Robert could continue, the technician walked into the office. When you examine him, be careful not to damage the EPM suit. It's highly... This is hardly the time, Henry, Robert commanded, glaring at him. 
I'm just saying. This is a billion dollar project. Why don't you go get the equipment for our doctor here? Robert demanded, getting more agitated by the minute. Look, Captain, if you just let me go into the airlock, I could take all the necessary precautions. Absolutely not. Do you think headquarters would have sent the damn CDC if they thought we could handle it? For Christ's sake, Henry, know your limits. The technician left and quickly returned with a modified hazmat suit and some surgical supplies. And we moved on towards Section B. Unlike the hallways we traversed before, these were large and well lit up. As we arrived at the airlock, we found Abby standing before the glass door, staring longingly at Mike's lifeless body. Abby, Robert said. I know, I know, it's time, she responded as she turned around. Oh, you're the doctor, she asked, her eyes red and voice trembling. I nodded. You'll figure out what did this to him, won't you? I just don't understand. Abby, why don't you come with me while they work? Robert said. You don't need to see this. As Robert led her back to the central dome, Henry started unpacking the cart of medical supplies, including isolation drapes and the hazmat suit. All right, I'm going to guide you through this. No need to mess up a perfectly good EPM suit, Henry said. What does CPM mean, anyway? I asked. Exoskeletal pressure modulator, Henry said, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. James and Jennifer helped me seal the hazmat suit, while Henry hung up the isolation drapes. I stepped through, while Jennifer entered a code behind me to open the airlock. My ears popped as they sealed the door shut behind me. Both the drapes and the airlock were transparent meaning they could observe everything I did, in addition to a mounted camera on my shoulder for closer view, displayed on the monitor on the other side. Just by the control panel, Mike lay dead, wearing a massive black suit, looking more like a robotic piece of machinery than a diver's gear. There were several cables and hooks hanging from the ceiling, and just turning him over was a massive task as he weighed about half a ton wearing that suit. His face was pale as a sheet, with thin streaks of blood pouring from every available orifice. The eyes were red from conjunctival bleeding, completely ridding them from any white. I'm ready, I said. All right. First thing you need to do is to simply inspect the suit. Look for any breaches in the integrity. It shouldn't be possible, but in the unlikely event that something broke through, a self-healing mesh should have formed. It kind of looks grey. I looked over every inch of his suit, from top to bottom. There! His feet! Henry yelled. Sure enough, there was a patch of grey that stood out from the matte black metal covering the rest of him. Oh, something actually perforated his suit, Henry said, surprised. I got closer, giving them a better view on the monitor. Clearly the puncher wasn't what killed him, though, he added. I had to agree with that assessment. Any breach not sealed off within a nanosecond would immediately crush him. But it seemed that the mesh had replaced whatever penetrated the suit at the same time as it was removed. Okay, next. Attach the cables to his shoulder. They're color-coded, so it should be easy enough. I attached the cables as instructed, which caused the suit to light up and start unhinging. The front of the suit opened up, revealing Mike's completely mangled body. What the hell? James asked. That's not pressure damage, Henry responded. Mike's ribs were broken outwards, though they had not torn apart his flesh. His chest seemed to have expanded to almost twice its normal size. I continued to remove the helmet, pulling it off his head. I looked into his eyes for a brief moment, baffled as to what could have caused his internal organs to essentially explode. For the briefest of moments, it seemed like his eyes moved to meet my gaze. Did you just see that? 
I asked. No one said a word. We all just stared at Mike, waiting for something to happen. His eyes moved again, darting in random directions as he started gargling, violently contracting his chest. Oh God, is he still alive? Jennifer asked. He opened his mouth, letting thousands of massive worms pour out onto the floor. They immediately crawled in every direction, up the walls onto the ceiling, desperately searching for a way out. Mike continued to spew out more slimy worms. His mouth tore open in the process, leaving his jaw completely unhinged before falling off. Once all the worms seemed to have exited his corpse, his chest tore open, revealing even larger worms. It quickly became apparent that all of his organs had been consumed, replaced with the disgusting creatures. Some of them started clinging to my suit as I swatted at them in panic. None of the others knew what to do. They could only stare at me, flailing around. As the worms touched each other, their flesh temporarily fused, forming longer versions of themselves, growing in size and then breaking off again. They wrapped around my arms and legs. I begged for someone to help me, but what could they do? Hang in there, Henry yelled as he fumbled with the panel for the airlock. Within seconds, a few small taps emerged from the ceiling, spewing what I could only assume was liquid nitrogen. Whatever it was, the worms froze in place, freezing to the point where I could break them into tiny pieces. It only took a moment, but all the worms had been killed off, and though my suit had partially protected me from the cold, I collapsed exhausted and shivering onto the ground. Get me the fuck out of here, I demanded, knowing fully well they couldn't do that until I dealt with the infestation. Robert had just returned in time to see what the commotion was about, and upon seeing what remained of Mike lying torn to pieces on the ground, he stopped in his tracks. After a minute of catching my breath, I got some sense back. With some morbid sense of humour and functioning on autopilot, I turned towards Henry. Sorry, but the suit isn't going to be salvaged. We're rejecting the whole frickin' airlock as soon as I get out of here. Henry turned to Robert, pleading for him to make me reconsider, despite what we'd all just witnessed. But Robert took my side. After removing the recording unit from the EPM suit, I packed the entire thing into an easily ejectable container while making sure that no worms remained on my suit. All I took was a small sample of a frozen worm packed into a vacuum container. I exited the airlock and handed the sample over to Jennifer. She'd prepared the previous parasites brought back by Mike and I told her to get everything ready so I could determine what we were dealing with. Robert started the procedure of ejecting the airlock's contents including what remained of Mike and the EPM suit, Henry pouting the whole time. James hadn't moved an inch since the event. He turned sickly pale, as if he just realised the severity of the situation. We have to tell him, Captain, he said quietly after a few minutes. Tell me what? I asked while getting out of the hazmat suit. Robert took a deep breath, mulling over his options. You're right. Tell me what, I repeated. The real reason why we're stationed down here. Death can be a beautiful thing, beyond all the stigma associated around the event. It's the beginning of a world that starts directly from the end of another. When a whale dies in extreme depths, they sink towards the ocean floor, where entire ecosystems arise from the decomposing bodies. This is called a whale fall. Mike's EPM suit had left behind three days' worth of footage. Henry was put on the task of preparing it for viewing. While we couldn't save him, nor the suit, we could at least figure out how Mike had died. 
As we waited, the captain decided it was time for me to learn the truth about their mission, and why no one on the surface had ever heard about the scientific wonder that was Talos. You saw all the dead sea creatures littering the ocean floor around the station, Robert asked. I recall the hundreds of mangled bodies of fish, not the most welcoming sight to the abyss. James told me something compelled them to dive down here. Some sort of sound? Robert nodded as he pulled up a computer. After a moment of fumbling, he clicked on a sound file. About five years ago, we recorded this coming from the depths of the Tonga Trench. It was an oddly synthetic sound like a whale's mating call had been pitched down and jumbled around, and in the midst of it, there was something that sounded like a whisper. They recorded something similar around the Mariana Trench, and called it the Biotwang, Robert said. The sound played on loop as we talked, oddly eerie for something so innocent. We first thought it came from a whale, just a bit distorted after travelling vast distances, or instrumental interference. But then we saw how it affected the wildlife in the region. Blooms of jellyfish appearing out of nowhere, and fish defying all instincts to dive towards crushing pressure. What made the sound, then? I asked. Robert pulled up some pictures on the screen. Creatures similar to roundworms, just pitch black. They looked nothing like what I'd just witnessed in the airlock, however. From what we can tell, there's a thus far completely undiscovered ecosystem somewhere down the trench, isolated for millions of years, unaffected by mass extinction events. They have evolved quite differently from life we see on the surface. It's like millions of single-celled organisms working together to form more complex creatures. But unlike themselves, the cells can detach and rejoin at will. We have named it the Synchitium. And, uh... That's what killed Mike. They could be part of it, but we just saw in the airlock is far larger than the microorganisms we gathered here. Before we could continue, James interrupted, letting us know the footage was ready to be viewed. If they ever decide to declassify the existence of this station, they'll never mention the creatures, nor the sound that alerted us to their presence. I'm sure one day... They'll hail all this as a supreme technological advancement. But truth be told, the reason why the Navy put billions and billions of dollars into this project so that humanity could traverse the ocean floor is simply because they want to find whatever is making that sound and find a way of using it. Cap, they're waiting for us, James said. We gathered in the central area. Abby sat in the back some distance away from everyone else. She seemed even worse for wear than before, frail, as if she'd lost weight in the past couple of hours since meeting her. Henry controlled the footage, ready to speed through to the important bits, as the descent itself was quite slow. Twenty thousand feet, the Hardal Zone. Everything we saw would be from Mike's point of view. The footage started at the airlock. Abby standing before him with a concerned expression on her face. Don't worry, I'll be back before you know it. It's not like it's my first time in the depths. It's not like they waste a billion dollars on me, Dad, anyway. She didn't seem consoled by his words. This time is different. We haven't tested the suit beyond 30,000 feet yet, Abby said. No, but we've tested pressure. The suit should be able to go much further before breaking. Henry forwarded the footage. Mike stood directly at the edge of the Tonga Trench. To his left, a platform extended even further down towards the Hardell Zone. An elevator sat at the platform centre. A short distance down the trench, he saw endlessly long tendrils gently swaying with the current. They belonged to the body of a malformed creature, looking like it couldn't possibly control its long appendages, Yet it seemed unfazed by the depths. Guys, are you seeing this? He said excitedly as he pointed at the bizarre thing. It's a magna pinna squid. He almost jogged along the edge to get a better view. 
the suit audibly exhausted by the efforts. Don't put too much strain on the suit, Henry interjected over the radio. Ah, it'll be fine. What else did they pay for? Mike asked. As he got closer to the squid, another popped up behind it, one with even longer appendages. Damn, I never thought I'd see one up so close. Stop messing around and get on the elevator, Henry demanded. Fine, let's not enjoy our jobs then, Mike responded. He boarded the elevator and strapped himself in. The journey would take him another 15,000 feet into the abyss. It was a loud, sturdy piece of machinery able to withstand the immense pressure of the dreaded Hadar zone. Mike himself would control the speed of the descent, only handing over control to Henry should something happen. Not long after the descent started, Mike stalled the elevator. The suit's making weird noises, he said. That's normal. It's adjusting to the pressure change. We told you it would happen the deeper you got. Henry explained with an annoyed tone. Yeah, I know, but you'll be fine. 27,000 feet. Once more, Mike stopped the elevator, directing his gaze at an edge sticking out from the cliffside. On it lay the corpse of a bowhead whale, almost a half a planet away from its natural habitat. The whale had been partially hollowed out, riddled with deep sea eels and tiny eyeless fish, an entire ecosystem thriving from its death. How did that whale get here? Mike asked. It died, like all the other creatures down here, Henry said. Yeah, but it's a bowhead. At least I think it is. Don't they live around the Arctic? Henry sighed. <sighs> Just continue the descent. 35,433 feet, horizon deep. The elevator reached the bottom of the trench after about an hour, allowing Mike to finally unbuckle himself from his seat. He grabbed a box of beacons to allow the next person to easier navigate the area. After stepping off the platform and getting away from its bright lights, it became abundantly clear that the bottom of the ocean was far from empty, and that the entire bed was covered in previously undiscovered life. Millions of fungal-like plants covering the floor, and transparent fat shrimps swimming between, apparently feeding off them. On the cliff wall itself, thousands of bioluminescent plants extended, just like a stalk with a blue bulb bending in the direction of Mike's movement. It was hauntingly beautiful, looking as alien as anything from another planet. He continued along the cliffside, putting down a beacon every hundred feet or so. I expected this place to be horrible, Mike said. You know, being named after the god of the underworld and all. No one responded to this comment. Guys, you can still hear me, right? Yes, Mike, we can hear you, Henry says. We're here to work, not make stupid quips. Has anyone ever told you how much better life can be if you at least try to enjoy it, Henry? Stop being such a killjoy. We're making history down here. Henry didn't respond. How about you hand Abby the radio? Well, I'd rather listen to the captain ramble about protocol going on. Mike stopped, dead in his tracks, reaching the end of the cliff. Before him was a steep fall leading down to an endless chasm of darkness. Henry, you sure the elevator took me all the way down the trench? He asked as he stared into the abyss. Yeah, you're at 35,000 feet. Well, it's just I'm standing at the edge of the cliff, and this is clearly not the bottom of the ocean. That's impossible. We surveyed the entire area with sonar. Well... I'm telling you. The ground beneath Mike crumbled to pieces. He slid off the edge of the cliff and dove further into the deep. The darkness now surrounding him was absolute. Nothing could possibly help him orient himself as he fell. To fall in the ocean was a much slower process, 
giving him time to think what kind of fate awaited him as he sunk to depths never before known by mankind. He called out for his crew members, while desperately clawing at the cliff. But even with the suit, he was unable to slow his descent. As he got deeper, the suit started emitting loud beeps, alarms to alert to rapid pressure changes exceeding 16,000 psi. But before he could even react, he hit the ground hard. Mike fell silent, passed out from the impact. Unknown number of feet. The void. Minutes after landing at unknown depths, Mike awoke to the sound of his suit beeping. The suit had held its ground and was just starting to adjust to the new pressure. The manometer was broken, and with his tracking device malfunctioning, we could only try to guess how far he'd fallen. Mike grunted as he got to his feet, taking some time to figure out what had happened. Henry, you there? He finally said. No response. Captain, anyone? Apart from a few malfunctioning instruments, most of the suit seemed intact, yet no contact could be made with the base. Everything past that point would be after the comms went down, and we all patiently awaited to learn of Mike's fate. Despite having fallen far beyond what we believed to be the ocean floor, he had just landed on another plateau, with an endless distance still progressing downwards. The abyss was ever-present, taunting us with its emptiness. Please respond, he begged, defeated. He activated the beacon still attached to him, and checked his surroundings. He'd landed directly in front of a cave leading inside the cliff wall, and moving steeply upwards. While protocol strictly dictated to wait for rescue in these situations, we could hear gargled sound emitting from the cave. Whatever it was, it compelled Mike to check out the cave. The walls inside were perfectly smooth, an impossible formation of rocks, reflecting the bright light shining from the EPM suit, lighting up the cave as far as it stretched. Mike stared at the shiny walls for a moment, adjusting the light. They'd seem smooth in an angle, but when light was pointed directly at them, it uncovered bizarre patterns, like symbols not corresponding to any known language. While he studied the symbols, a loud sound shook through the cave, almost sweeping Mike off his feet. It sounded similar to the bio-twang, but with slight differences. The rhythm was changed. It seemed to put Mike further into a trance, and he diligently followed the source, ignoring any chance of rescue the further in he went. The cave led to a much larger cavern, extending beyond the reach of any light source he had available. Unlike the tunnel, these walls weren't smooth, but were covered in millions of tiny holes, each perfectly round, each identical to the last. Upon closer inspection, the holes weren't empty, but filled with worms, just like the ones we'd seen spew out of his body inside the airlock. They wriggled and reached for Mike as he walked through the cavern, pulled towards the sound in the distance, getting louder with each passing step. The deeper he got, the less he seemed distracted by the holes, which were growing in size alongside the worms. Mike's only hypnotic objective was to reach the sound. On top of the worms, spindly, long-legged creatures walked across. They looked like shellless spider crabs, dipping their limbs into the worms, merging temporarily while seeming to feed them. For with each dip into the holes, their limbs seemed to grow shorter, while the worms expanded. Eventually, he reached a corner of the cavern, and with it, the source of the sound. It was a half-consumed whale calf attached to the wall, bound by hundreds of massive worms extending into its torn flesh. Despite being half-eaten, and broken beyond any chance at life, it somehow didn't succumb as if the worms themselves kept it alive. 
involuntary life support, repurposed for their own needs. The calf gaped open its half-eaten jaw, so mangled Mike could see straight into its vocal cords, which were also covered in the worms, tugging and moving them into position. The whale screamed, emitting further jumbled sound that pulled Mike even closer. While Mike was distracted, several worms had emerged from their holes, rapidly swarming around him. Within seconds, they joined together, wrapping around his legs and climbing up the suit. It temporarily brought Mike back to sanity, as he tried to tear the worms off, but they were faster than him, trapped inside a slow metal box. He stumbled to the ground, allowing more worms and their spindles to cover each of his limbs. The creatures merged together, forming a sheet of flesh that soon covered the entirety of his body. Mike fell silent, and the camera showed nothing but a flesh-colored mass, muffling any audio save for Mike's panicked breath. He screamed as a loud bang almost broke the speakers, the sound of his suit being perforated and the mesh refilling the hole we'd found on the sole of his feet. The creatures had gotten inside his suit, digging into his flesh, Mike crying in agony before falling silent. We all stood, speechless, in front of the monitor, now displaying nothing but a timer, proving the camera was still running. Abby had left, with James following to console her. That can't be it, Robert said. Let me forward it. Henry said, half whispering in shock. We forwarded through almost three days of nothing, while the worms incubated inside Mike, trapped alone in the cavern, no one knowing where he was. The camera started clearing up, the flesh sheet peeling off as the view showed that Mike had returned to the elevator. During the three days down in the trench, the synctium had occupied covering it with their fleshy appendages. Mike was controlling it, or whatever remained of him, inside the suit. He wandered towards the station, flakes of synctial flesh falling off him with each step. His crew called out for him over the radio, now that they could reach him, but Mike could do nothing but gargle as worms had consumed most of his lungs. At the airlock, he stumbled inside, ready to unleash hell within the station, but for a brief moment, Mike managed to halt himself. Perhaps the thought of hurting those he loved was enough for him to temporarily gain control, just enough time to shut down the airlock, putting himself into lockdown. Mike collapsed to the ground. He had died days ago, but his will remained even as he turned into nothing more than a vessel for the horrors he now carried within him. The footage ended. We stood in silence for a moment, none of us daring to speak a word about Mike's cause of death. I hardly believed it, despite having almost fallen victim to the same fate myself. Henry, call headquarters, tell them we're shutting this project down, Robert said, breaking the silence. Jennifer, destroy the sample from the airlock. It's still sealed, right? Jennifer nodded, before heading towards the lab. We need to make sure that, whatever this is, it stays in the abyss. I joined Henry as he attempted to call headquarters, the radio returning nothing more than jumbled static. Robert was checking all security feed, sending out drones to scavenge for the synctium at the elevator. Captain, the comms are completely down. Can't get any signal. On the security feed, we saw that the flesh of the synctium had stretched along the ground, covering some of the corpses of fish that littered the ocean floor. It was impossibly large, using the elevator and platform as a scaffold for climbing up towards the station. A loud, metallic clang sounded through the station, followed by an alarm. What the hell was that? I asked. Hull breach, Sector C. An automated voice said. Isolators, Robert demanded. What about... Just do it, he continued. 
Henry frantically tried to navigate the security system, attempting to get an idea as to the extent of the damage. What's in Sector C? I asked. It's the lab. Fuck. I hope Jennifer hadn't got there yet, Henry said. While the station sealed, trapping anyone inside, another loud bang shook us. The alarm sounded again. Hull breach. Sector B. Oh, fuck. What now? Henry asked. Robert stood still in shock frozen by the decision of saving the station or fleeing. We have to evacuate, was all he said. Most of my old crew, after leaving the Navy, struggled to get over their longing for the ocean. Such was the case for my submarine captain, Louis Johnson. He always claimed the sea would be his final resting place, where he truly belonged, and following his honourable discharge, he went straight into hyperbaric pipeline welding. It's a dangerous job, when the only enemy is invisible, always stalking each dive, each new mission. A foe that can't be sensed, but with the ability to destroy everything you are in, but with the ability to destroy everything you are in a split second. Pressure. <clears throat> Maybe I'm cursed, unable to live on land with my own people, but at least I'll die where I belong, he'd said. Johnson would be lucky enough to forever be united with his one true love, at a sight of a burst pipe that took him away, finally making him one with the deep blue. It's funny how the brain operates as everything around you is falling to pieces, far beyond your own control. Once there's nothing left you can do, the mind turns to a place of safety, fond memories from a time long since past. For me, those memories belonged to my time of service, to my old captain and crew. It wasn't an easy time, but it was filled with purpose, with my problems solely confined to the ocean. When Robert yelled at me to get my ass in gear, I finally snapped back to reality. Doc, come on, we've got to get the hell out of here, he shouted. James returned to the central dome alongside Abby. They'd heard the alarms, but hadn't the faintest idea what had occurred during their brief absence. Get to Section A. There are still two transport capsules. Get number 05 ready for departure and wait for me, Robert said. Cap, what are you going to do? James asked. Jennifer is in lockdown. I'm getting her out. What if the creatures got inside? Abby asked. Robert thought for a moment before handing her a walkie. If you don't hear from me, just leave, he ordered. The station shook as another hole was torn through one of the sections. My ears popped from the shockwave. I'm coming with you, James said. You're not facing them alone. No, we need you to pilot the transport capsule. If you get hurt, we're stuck down here. It wasn't a valid excuse. They all knew fully well that the submarine was easy enough for any of the crew members to pilot, but Robert refused to risk any more lives, and would use whatever reason he could come up with. Captain, please. That's an order. Get out of here, now. They hesitantly agreed and started leaving. I'll join you then. I know nothing about this station or the sub, but at least I can assist you should something happen, I said knowing he couldn't come up with any excuse to stop me. He reluctantly agreed, and together we headed for the labs in Section C, worrying that Jennifer might be trapped behind the airlock, or worse. Drowning is such a horrible way to die. Once you realize there's no way to reach the surface, that you're trapped in a cold, dark tomb, your throat simply closes up. No matter how hard you try to inhale, your body simply refuses, even as the agonizing pain of running out of air overpowers our natural instinct to breathe. You simply refuse to give in to the overwhelming desire. It isn't until the body starts shutting down, and the corners of your vision start to darken, that you reach the breaking point, and your brain decides to pull something in, regardless of whether air is present or not. Suddenly ice-cold water flows in through your throat 
unstoppably filling your lungs, so desperate for air. It's a clumsy, painful way to go, and by the time the water has filled each alveoli, most are still conscious, just enough time to regret their decision to ever enter the ocean. I thought it was funny, as we ran towards the airlock, that at least we wouldn't drown. Surely the worms would consume us, or the pressure from a collapsing station would instantly crush us. How did the hull get breached anyway? I asked as we got closer. It's impossible, but I'm sure it's those fucking monsters, Robert said. The alarm had stopped alerting us about the hull breach, and was now recommending a station-wide evacuation. Warning. Hull integrity severely compromised. All crew report to designated docking stations, it said. How much time do we have? Not enough. As we turned the corner at Section C, we saw Jennifer sitting against the wall on the wrong side of the airlock. It took a moment to realize the horrors of her situation as we saw her legs fuse with the flesh of the syncytium. They had started eating away at her lower body, digging their way through her flesh and rapidly replacing her organs with their own meat. Despite all this, she remained conscious. Jen, Robert said, the only word he could muster from the shock of what lay in front of his eyes. She slowly turned her head towards us, with her eyes red from hemorrhaging as worms had consumed her insides. Captain, is that you? She said weakly. I'm here, Jen. I guess the sample wasn't dead after all, she joked with a hoarse voice as she coughed up what could only be a mixture of blood and lung parenchyma. Maybe tell the doctor to double-check these things in the future. He's here with me now, Robert explained. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jen, but I know there's nothing left to do. I guess this is it. She coughed up, violently spewing out pieces of her lung and worms. Don't worry, Captain. It's not your fault that a monster from the abyss crawled its way up to destroy us, she said, voice cracking as she writhed in agony. I looked over at Robert. He looked horrified, but couldn't take his eyes off her. Oh, it really hurts. Please... Eject the S section, she cried. I just want it to be over. Robert nodded, forgetting that she couldn't see him. I went over to the control panel. It was fairly easy to use, especially after having witnessed Henry mess with it before. All I needed was the passcode. I thought it wouldn't be right to let Robert essentially execute her himself. I'll do it, I assured them. Rob, Jennifer said. Yes? Don't let these fuckers get to the surface. Promise me that much. I promise. Her abdomen started bulging out. She screamed in pain as the worm started tearing open her flesh. Captain, the code? I asked. He told me the numbers, and I input them without hesitating. Years of watching people suffer a prolonged death knowing that we could do nothing but pointlessly extend their lives, had desensitized me to pulling the plug. Immediately hatches opened up on the walls, and an alarm sounded as water started pouring in, but since the hull had already been partially breached, they quickly collapsed in on themselves. Within a few seconds, Jennifer had died. Let's get out of here, Robert said. We ran back towards the central area. We had to traverse the entire station to get towards Section A. It was the only remaining escape, but as we got to the offices, we could hear something moving within the walls, knocking their way through the pipes. The pumps, Robert yelled. They're getting in through the fucking pumps. Talos's pumps were ancient machinery compared to the rest of the station. As the dome was inserted, they needed to move tons of water outside against the immense pressure, but after finishing the station, they had been long forgotten, left inside the walls while they installed more permanent solutions. Before we could react, 
The walls broke open, and the syncytium poured itself through the holes, making the shape of malformed flesh, extending rapidly alongside the walls. We were cut off from our only escape, with only the office available as temporary refuge from the oncoming swarm of worms and flow of flesh. But our safe haven would quickly become just another prison to extend our survival. It won't hold them for long, Robert said. What now? Robert went straight for his desk, pulling out a pistol from the top drawer. You brought a gun to the bottom of the ocean? I asked. You didn't? He shot back. Never know when you might have to quell a mutiny. <laughs> he laughed nervously. He could tell I wasn't amused. We both knew a gun wouldn't slow them down significantly, but any help was welcome. He continued to rummage through the closets in the room, eventually pulling out two unused hazmat suits, just like the one I'd used while inspecting Mike. He kept you safe inside the airlock. The worms couldn't penetrate the suit, right? Robert asked with pleading eyes. Look, they breached the EPM suit. Metal. I don't think these will make a big difference. Might slow them down, but that's it, I said. It's our best shot. The worms are starting to pile up on the door, forming a contracting mesh, slightly cracking the glass. It's now or never. James better have the damn sub ready to go, Robert said as we got into the suits. He fired a shot, not at the door, but at the tempered glass wall beside it, shattering it into a million cubical pieces as we jumped through. I stumbled to the ground, a few worms getting onto my hand as I stood back up. Robert pulled them off me and shoved me forward. We spurted for the entrance to Section A. We were far faster than the worms, but they'd formed a mesh covering most of the ceiling and dropped down on top of us for each step we took. Another hole in the wall burst open directly above the airlock towards Section A, causing another slump of meat to land in front of the door. Shit! Robert yelled as he instinctively pulled his weapon and fired at the mass on the floor. I froze in place as the worms disintegrated from the bullet's impact, reforming, hastily crawling towards us. I tried to turn away and run, but I didn't react in time. To my surprise, the worms completely ignored my presence and headed straight for Robert, pouring onto him from all directions, pulling him to the ground. He screamed in agony as they formed around his limbs, making him unable to fight back. I hurried towards him and tried to pull them off, but for each worm I removed, a hundred others joined in. Within seconds, they managed to tear a hole at the armpit region of his suit. They immediately wriggled themselves in through the hole. I desperately tried to pull him up, but he shoved me away as he realized there wasn't any hope left for him. Get out of here, dog. He gargled as blood started to fill his lungs. I didn't even hesitate, shamefully. I ran for my life while the syncytium was too distracted by consuming Robert. No matter what I had done, he was already dead. The hallways narrowed drastically as I once more returned to Section A. I frantically tried to input the code to close the airlocks. It took me two attempts with shaky fingers to get the correct code. But within a second, the door sealed, and I was once more separated from the abomination on the other side. I'm so sorry, Robert, I whispered to myself. The central dome finally gave in under the pressure, massive streams of water quickly collapsing the ceiling. The station fell apart, and the central power was annihilated under the flood. Plunged into darkness and silence, I ventured further towards the docking station. Each section of Talos supposedly had their own backup generator, but it hadn't activated yet, making it hard to navigate through the narrow labyrinth of hallways. James, can you hear me? I called, my voice echoing endlessly. I bumped my head as I saw a light appearing in the distance. James came running towards me, holding a flashlight. Doc, you're still with us, thank God, he said his joy quickly fleeting as he realized I had come alone. 
what happened? Where's Jen and the captain? I just shook my head in response. No words could convey what had happened in the dome, and their absence proved enough about their unfortunate outcome of our futile escape attempt. No time to worry about that now. We need to get out of here. The capsule's just about ready to leave for the surface. We only need Henry to figure out how to get the power back. When we arrived at the docking station, I was relieved by the increase in ceiling height, if ever so slightly. Henry was busy at work on the control panel, trying to figure out what had cut the power from the backup generator. Abby standing behind him with a flashlight. God damn it, he yelled. Something has torn away the backup generator. Not sure how, but I'm sure I know what. He sighed. Between the lack of power and the damaged hull, the sub can't release from the station. We're stranded here. None of us spoke a word. Trapped in a tin can 20,000 feet below the surface with no transport. After what felt like an eternity, Henry finally broke the silence. Well, do you have any ideas then, genius? Abby asked. Henry sighed. As a matter of fact, I do. He walked into the capsule and started messing around with the electronics, eventually pulling off one of the panels. There are three batteries powering this up, and as I see it, I could take one out. You should still have enough power to get you all to the surface. Us? James asked. I need to connect this battery to the airlock, he continued as he pulled one of them out from the capsule. Then I'll override the door. It'll blow open from the pressure, and the resulting wave of water should forcefully eject the sub. What about you? Abby asked. Well, someone has to stay behind to follow through on this plan. Let me do it then, James interjected. No, you idiot. One wrong connection and the door fries, locking forever. I'm the only one with the expertise. There has to be another way. There isn't. Trust me. James and I looked at each other, both wanting to speak up, but neither able to come up with an alternative solution. Henry went back into the transport capsule, sealed the panel shut again. Yeah, I wish you were all smarter. Maybe one of you could have stayed behind, he said, as sarcastically as ever but for the first time with the slightest smirk on his face. Thank you, I said. Yeah, well, time for you to go, he said as he shut the door to the capsule. We watched as Henry walked away for the last time, ready to face his fate. An asshole to the bitter end, but one with a kind heart. Like his other parish crewmates, he would forever remain at the ocean basin never again witnessing sunlight. Time went on forever, while we waited for a wave of water that might just as lightly crush us in an instant. But with a ton of luck, we'd be ejected out from the station, and from there we could reach the surface. It would be the most violent takeoff in the station's history, but also the last. Minutes later, we heard the sound of the airlock opening, before shattering to pieces under the immense pressure of exploding water and sink into your flesh. Seconds later, the wave hit us, and we shot out from Talos, the hallway behind us falling apart as we did. It hit us hard, and roughed us up a bit, but we survived. James took control of the vessel, and didn't hesitate to start ascending towards the surface. Abby and I stared out the window. On the other side, we could see the utterly crushed remains of Talos, dimly illuminated by the light still powered up by the generators at Section C, which had been completely covered by the flesh of the Sinkitium. The thousands of corpses that previously littered the ocean floor had been cleaned up, and were now a part of the ever-growing monster from the abyss. A wave of relief washed over me, with my heart coming down for each foot of our ascension. I no longer felt the need to constantly look out of the window, the world outside was dark, and whatever life once remained down there had been consumed, alongside my longing for the ocean. 
Once we reached a depth of 5,000 feet in the middle of the midnight zone, we managed to establish contact with the USS Orion and called for an emergency evacuation. They were quite a distance away, but by the time we'd reached the surface, they'd pick us up, albeit curious as to what had happened in the depths. At 3,000 feet, the first rays of daylight greeted us with the warmth of the sun. The ocean started filling up with peaceful life, fish thriving in the waters, completely ignorant to the horrors that existed directly below them. The vast darkness turned to a calming blue, and for the first time since being hired for this mission, I felt safe. Before long, we breached the surface, and were greeted by a team wearing hazmat suits as we boarded the ship. We'd been unable to alert them to the situation. All they knew was that a potential contagion existed in the depths, one we could have brought back with us. So, understandably, they locked us up in the sick bay, isolated from the rest of the crew. For 72 hours, they prodded us, taking multiple blood samples, even a CSF probe. After they all returned normal, and no sign of sickness was apparent, they led us into more comfortable living arrangements as we set for shore. After being released from the sick bay, I hardly saw James and Abby. They spent their time in their rooms, only coming out for the occasional interview. Headquarters were incredibly curious as to how a state-of-the-art installation suddenly collapsed, as we had absolutely no proof of the events that had transpired. They needed someone to blame, but as a part of the CDC, and not the original Talos crew, I was safe from prosecution. All that was required of me was to sign a non-disclosure agreement, one I'm breaking now to warn you about the horrors of the abyss. We know more about what exists in our outer space than we do about life in our oceans, and that's how it should remain forever. These creatures, the Syncytium, can't be killed. As long as one single cell remains, it will be enough to restart their hives. And I fear that, with the consumption of Talos, they've learned about life on the surface. Now that I'm posting this, I'm heading for the center of disease control. I can feel them wriggling inside my chest as I type this, ready to burst out at any moment. <laughs> I guess the suit didn't protect me after all. I hope James and Abby are safe, that they get a second chance at living a happy life. I'm so, so sorry. Ah, brilliant, brilliant story there. Um, I hope you had time to listen to all three parts. Some of you may have heard parts one and two elsewhere, but I think I managed to deliver a bit of a treat by putting all three together for you in one video on this fine, fine Friday evening. Well, I'm in England, as you uh, might have seen from tonight's uh, background visuals, visiting my folks and having a lovely time. But of course, I'll try not to let this uh, affect my schedule on YouTube, so you can expect another video on Monday. Nothing stops me, I can tell you. <laughs> well, until then, you have a fantastic weekend, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay? <laughs>